Titanic, also known as the Ship of Dreams, sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City on the 15th of the 4th, 1912. Over 1,500 of the 2,224 on board died, which is still to this day the deadliest peacetime sinking of a cruise ship. She was said to be unsinkable and carried many of the world's wealthiest people, including John Jacob Astor, who was thought to be the richest man in the world at the time, Isidore Strauss, the owner of Macy's Department Stores, and Benjamin Guggenheim, a powerful mining magnate. Through the wonderful work of Video Digital Revival and their amazing demo Titanic, Honor and Glory, we can see in gorgeous detail exactly what the Titanic looked like, down to the tiniest detail. Join us as we go back in time to Titanic. As the name suggests, the RMS Titanic was a Royal Mail steamer. To this end, the post office was a rather important place on the Titanic. Sea post clerks were highly skilled and respected postal workers who sorted, cancelled and redistributed the mail in transit. Most were selected from the ranks of the Railway Mail Service or the Foreign Mail Section. Regarded as the best of the best, these men typically sorted more than 60,000 letters a day making few errors. Their hard work and efficiency allowed the mail to be delivered immediately or forwarded directly to other destinations at the end of the voyage. Titanic had five sea post clerks aboard, three Americans and two British. Oscar Scott Woody, a native of Roxburgh, North Carolina. John Star March was the oldest of the American postal clerks assigned to Titanic and appeared to carry a curse of bad luck during his eight-year career as a sea post clerk, his ships were involved in eight separate emergencies. William Logan Gwynne spent six years as a sorting clerk in the foreign mail section before going to sea. He was originally assigned to sail on the American Lines SS Philadelphia, but requested an earlier voyage upon learning that his wife Florence was gravely ill at home in Brooklyn. He was transferred to Titanic. Florence Gwynne recovered, but her family kept the news of Will's death from her for many months. Woody, March and Gwynne worked alongside British clerks James Bertram Williamson and John Richard Jago Smith. Both Williamson and Smith were bachelors, who financially supported their siblings and ageing parents. On April 9, 1912, March and Gwynne toured their new ship and found much to like. Titanic's mail sorting room was far superior to any they had worked before. Most mail sorting rooms at the time were far removed from where the mail bags were stored, often relegated to a cramped and poorly ventilated space. The mail bag storage compartment aboard Titanic, however, was conveniently located directly below the mail sorting room. In all, 3,364 mail bags were bought aboard Titanic at three points, at its embarkation port at Southampton, England and at Cherbourg, France and to Queenstown before the ship headed for its final destination of New York City. Before sailing, the clerks carried out the routine tasks of checking the mail stacks and sorting those that did not require their attention during the voyage. As Titanic set sail, the five postal workers began sorting the mail, distributing letters and packages into mail bags according to their final destination. Their goal was to dispatch Titanic's mail immediately upon arrival at the quarantine station in New York Bay where all incoming ships were detained for health inspection purposes. The five postal clerks were celebrating Oscar Scott Woody's 44th birthday in their private dining room when Titanic crashed into the iceberg. Realising that something was terribly wrong, they rushed to the mail sorting room and found the starboard hold already beginning to flood. Beginning with the registered mail, they began hauling mail sacks to the upper decks. John Richard Jago Smith was dispatched to the bridge to report on conditions but his report only confirmed what Captain Edward J. Smith already knew. The Titanic was sinking. Mail was considered a precious cargo. Steamship companies and the postal system went to great lengths to ensure its safety. Sea post clerks were expected to protect the mail at any cost. During Titanic's sinking, the five clerks on board tried desperately to save the mail and in the process forfeited any chance they had to escape the doomed ship. None of the Titanic's postal clerks survived the sinking. Only the bodies of Oscar Scott Woody and John Star March were recovered from the wreck site. Due to its poor condition, Woody's body was buried at sea. 
March's remains were shipped home on May 3, 1912, and interred at Newark, New Jersey. Rescuers made every attempt to properly identify the bodies recovered at sea following Titanic sinking. Each body was assigned a number as it was recovered, and a small effects bag stamped with that number was used to hold the personal items found on the body. Woody's bag contained a watch, a fob, a chain and clip, two fountain pens, letters, a knife, cufflinks, one gold ring, keys and chain, and ten dollars and two cents. March's bag contained his gold watch and chain, as well as his ring with the initial M. While there is no way of knowing exactly how many letters were lost when Titanic sank, newspaper accounts at the time indicated that there were 200 registered mail sacks containing approximately 1.6 million pieces of mail, while the remaining 3,164 standard mail bags each held about 2,000 pieces of mail each. The entire loss was estimated between 6 and 9 million pieces of mail and between 7 and 800 parcel post shipments. The recovery of paper banknotes from the Titanic wreck site in 1987 raised the possibility that some of the ship's mail may one day be salvaged. Letters and newspapers may have survived for a century in the dark and chilly waters of the North Atlantic. The boiler rooms, of which there were six aboard the Titanic, were where the ship's 29 coal-fired boilers are housed. Of Titanic's 29 boilers, 24 were double-ended and five single-ended. Altogether, they contained a total of 159 furnaces to heat water and send the steam to the reciprocating engines. The boilers were 4.8 metres in diameter and 20 feet long, each weighing 91.5 tonnes and capable of holding 48.5 tonnes of water. They were fed around the clock by 179 firemen and consumed 600 tonnes of coal a day. Boiler Room 1 consisted of five single-ended boilers. It was on the tank top. It was connected to the third funnel uptake with Boiler Room 2. This room was between Boiler Room 2 and Reciprocating Engine Room. Boiler Room 1 was mainly used to provide power when the ship was in port. It was disintegrated when the ship broke up. The boilers can be found in the debris field. It is entirely possible that a couple of the boilers were lit up after the collision in an attempt to keep a steady supply of steam as the forward boiler room stopped producing steam when they became submerged. However, since none of the engineering crew who remained at their post survived, it's hard to know for sure if these boilers were ever used during the sinking. However, if some of these boilers were lit up after the collision, then that could explain why some survivors saw lights remain on after the breakup. As each individual boiler room flooded, the fires in them had to be put out. This process gradually reduced the available power on board the ship through the sinking. As there ended up being fewer and fewer boilers remaining to carry the electrical load of the vessel. The gradual weakening of power on board was experienced in numerous ways throughout the night. Lights were seen dimming and flickering on several occasions. The wireless signal progressively grew weaker through the night and the lights began to glow a dull red minutes before the final plunge began. Additionally, some reported in the very late stages of the sinking hearing emergency power generators coming to life deep within the ship. In the end, Boiler Room 2 was likely one of the final boiler rooms left producing power for the ship Boiler Room 1 had never been lit during the voyage. And whether or not it could have been lit in time to provide power during the sinking is questionable. The breakup occurred just over Boiler Rooms 1 and 2 and as such it stands to reason that the breakup and subsequent destruction of the final two boiler rooms on board may have been the root cause of the final electrical failure on board the ship. For the two events occurred almost simultaneously. Nevertheless, this is disputed by accounts of survivors who watched her go down and said that the breakup happened after the lights went out. On the night of April 14, 1912, Frederick Barrett was working hard in his role as the Titanic's chief stoker when the ship hit an iceberg and thousands of gallons of water began flooding into the vessel. 
Within three hours, the unsinkable ship had slipped beneath the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, taking the lives of more than 1,500 passengers and crew. Barrett had been among the first crew members to see water gush into the ship and work to try to keep its engines going by stoking the furnaces powering its boilers. Before it became clear, the vessel was going to sink. The worker became one of only 705 passengers and crew to survive after he was put in charge of one of the lifeboats, which held mostly women and children. They were then saved by the rescue vessel, the Carpathia. Remarkably, Barrett, who is portrayed in James Cameron's 1997 Hollywood film about the disaster, also saved the lives of an estimated 70 people when his quick thinking averted a disaster as the lifeboats were being lowered into the water. Without his action in cutting the ropes of his boat and pushing it free after it had landed in the water, another rescue vessel full of survivors would have crashed onto them, likely killing many of the passengers in both boats. But despite his heroics, Barrett then tragically died in 1931 from tuberculosis, after his wife and two daughters lost their lives to the same disease. The Marconi Room was the place where wireless operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride held communication with ships and shore over a Marconi transmitter. Communication over the wireless worked using dots and dashes. For example, S is three dots and O is three dashes. When put together, you get the distress signal, SOS, sent during the sinking. When the purser brought messages from passengers to send forward, it was their job to send them to shore. Between these private messages, the operators also received messages from other ships, mostly iceberg warnings. The room was part of the officer's quarters and consisted of three small rooms, the first being the operator's cabin or office. This room contained the equipment for the main Marconi transmitter, as well as an emergency transmitter. Other equipment included pneumatic tubes and clocks, made by the Magneta Time Company. The small room to the left contained the operator's berthing, as well as a wash basin and cupboard. The silent room was the name given to the room that was to the right of the operator's cabin that contained the main transmitter. The ship's T-type aerial also led into an insulator atop the roof of this room. It contained many pieces of electrical switch gear for controlling the wireless set. Among these was a switch for switching over to the emergency set. The room was destroyed during the sinking. Not a lot is visible in pictures of the wreck except for switch gear hanging from their cables. The aerial most likely snapped during the sinking and due to the high voltages used, it is likely that pieces of switch gear exploded from being flooded out. Sparks from the aerial lead-in were also seen by passengers during the sinking. The bridge was the area from which the RMS Titanic was commanded, housing the ship's steering gear, engine order telegraphs and other essential mechanics to maintain the ship's speed and heading. The bridge was located on the forwardmost part of the boat deck. The officers' quarters and wheelhouse were located directly aft of the bridge. When the iceberg was sighted by the lookouts, they rang the warning bell three times, signalling to the bridge that there was danger ahead. Immediately following the ringing of the bell, lookout Frederick Fleet picked up the crow's nest telephone and called the bridge. In the wheelhouse, 6th officer Moody picked up the phone asking, What did you see? Fleet responded, Iceberg, right ahead. Moody replied thank you and hung up, passing the information on to First Officer Murdoch, who commanded hard to starboard, planning to eventually port around the berg, but it was too close. Murdoch went to the wheelhouse to close the watertight doors. Boxhall arrived on the bridge from the boat deck, while Captain Smith came from his quarters. What did we strike, he asked. Murdoch replied, an iceberg, sir. Bruce Ismay also arrived on the bridge and asked Smith what happened. We have struck ice, the old man explained. Do you think the ship is seriously damaged? I'm afraid she is, replied Smith. Once the order was given to abandon ship, the bridge remained almost completely empty until approximately 2.10am when Stuart Edward Brown saw Captain Smith walk onto the bridge, alone at this time. Thomas Andrews went to look for him there and they had a little conversation. 
Cecil Fitzpatrick and Engineer Stewart, who believed in the safety of the ship, saw Smith and Andrews talking on the port side of the bridge entrance. He didn't eavesdrop on them, and so we don't know exactly what they said, as they both died in the sinking. But he heard the tail end of the conversation. We can't stay any longer. She is going. Cecil was so shocked at the news that he fainted and didn't wake up until the water was all around him. Andrews went to take a look at the lowering of collapsible A before he went to the port side with Captain Smith. Water was pouring over the wooden gunwale of the bridge wing now and as the water gushed over it Smith and Andrews climbed atop of it and jumped overboard. Some survivors say they saw Smith enter the wheelhouse on the bridge and drown there when it was engulfed by the rapidly oncoming water. The bridge was destroyed when the first funnel toppled over on it. The prominent feature that remains is the bronze telemotor for the ship's wheel and the base mountings for the walls of the wheelhouse. The bridge wing cabs on both sides broke up and collapsed. This area was entirely made of wood to reduce influences on the compass and was heavily damaged in the sinking. The crew's quarters were on E-deck and they were located along a corridor named Scotland Road. This corridor helped crew members and third class passengers get from one end of the ship to the other. The crew were jammed into rooms with stacks of berths and the stewards dubbed these as glory holes. Certain improvements in these quarters were included on Titanic over those on Olympic by Thomas Andrews and the crew were grateful for these minor amenities. The glory holes also had special stewards assigned to them. The stewardesses had a different lot on board. They were berthed in two-person cabins scabbered throughout the first and second class passenger areas of the ship. There were 18 stewardesses on board and about 150 stewards to see to the passengers needs. There were a total of 908 crew members aboard Titanic and 696 of them perished in the sinking. Accommodation was provided for the crew as follows. About 75 of the deck department including officers and doctors, 320 of the engine room department including engineers and 544 of the victualling department including purses and leading stewards. The crew of the Titanic was something of a well-oiled machine consisting of 908 individuals, all of who were expected to carry out their duty to the fullest. Larger than any single passenger group on board, feeding all the members of the crew proved to be a challenge. To help maintain order in crew dining, the ship did not have one centralised crew mess that all crew members would share, but rather many separate rooms set aside for specific groups of the crew to dine in. The officers had a mess located on the starboard side of the boat deck, directly at the base of the third funnel. Off-duty officers were also free to utilise the officers' smoke room located near the cabins just aft of the bow. The postal clerks and Marconi operators shared a mess just forward of the maids and valet saloon on sea deck, while seamen and firemen had separate mess halls on sea deck, just beneath the forecastle. Purses would dine with their passengers in first and second class, their tables often being sought after for dinner. The first class dining saloon was one out of five locations for first class passengers to eat. The room was located on D deck, measuring 114 feet long and 92 feet wide. The room could seat 554 passengers, set at 115 tables for 2 to 12 people. If they wanted, the parents could allow their children to eat here with them, but not if the dining room was fully booked. The dining room was decorated in wooden panelling, painted white, and the floors were covered in blue linoleum tiles, featuring an elaborate red and yellow pattern. The room's portholes were elegantly concealed by inner leaded glass windows, giving passengers the impression that they were eating on shore instead of at sea. For even more atmosphere, the windows were lit from behind during the evening meals. The dining room's meals were prepared in the first and second class galley next door, which also serviced the second class dining room, similarly located on the same deck aft of the galley and the pantries. Breakfast was from 8am until 10am, lunch was from 1 till 2.30pm, and dinner from 7pm till 8.15pm. Passengers were alerted to when meals were being served by the ship's bugler, Peter W. Fletcher, playing the roast beef of Old England. The bugle was blown for breakfast at 8am, lunch at 1pm and dinner at 6pm. 
Dinner was certainly an elegant affair, with the men in dinner suits and the women wearing the latest fashions and imported exotic perfumes and showing off their finest jewellery all while eating a feast fit for royalty. On Sundays the dining room was also used for Anglican church service, which was conducted by the captain or, in his absence, by a minister travelling in first class. The service was accompanied by a quintet which included a piano. The doors were open at the following times. 8am to 10am for breakfast, 1pm to 2.30 for lunch and 7pm till 8.15pm for dinner. The forward grand staircase was the piece de resistance of the Titanic's first class public rooms. The two storey high A deck level featured a large wrought iron and glass dome overhead that allowed natural light to enter the stairwell during the day. The dome was fringed with a delicately moulded plaster and rested on the deck housing surrounding the stairwell. It was covered by a protective box to protect the dome from the elements and which also contained the lighting to illuminate the dome from behind in the evening. In the centre of the dome hung a large crystal and gilt chandelier. The small beaded crystal chandelier fixtures identified on the wreck only hung in the forward parts of the A and boat deck levels. The rest contained cut glass shades. Each staircase was built of solid Irish oak, with each banister containing elaborate wrought iron grills with ormolu swags in the Louis XIV style. The staircases were 20 foot wide and projected 17 foot from the bulkhead. The surrounding entrance halls were appointed in the same polished oak panelling, carved in the neoclassical William and Mary style. The panels of the newel posts were carved with high relief garlands, each one of a unique design, and topped by pineapple finials. Just behind the staircase were three elevator shafts that provided passengers access from their staterooms to the promenade deck. The floors were laid with cream-coloured linoleum. They were interspersed with black medallions. Armchairs and sofas upholstered in blue were provided just off the staircases and potted palms in raised holders dotted each level. On the boat deck level was an upright piano, allowing the ship's orchestra to hold impromptu concerts in the stairwell. On the central landing of the A-deck staircase was a clock, flanked by two carved allegorical figures symbolising honour and glory, crowning time. A bronze cherub sculpture holding an illuminated torch graced the central newel post at the base of this staircase. There were likely smaller replica cherubs, which graced each end of the B and C deck levels. On the D deck level, as the staircase opened onto the reception room, the central post held a huge gilt candelabra with electric lighting. The Grand Staircase was one of the most recognisable features of the Titanic. The first class smoking room, located on A-deck, off the aft Grand Staircase landing was a late night lounge where first class male passengers could congregate, socialise, discuss matters of business or politics, smoke, drink and play games of chance, except on Sundays. In keeping with social conventions of the time, the room was exclusive to men. In order to recreate the same atmosphere of a gentleman's club, the room was decorated with dark mahogany panelling, inlaid with mother of pearl and richly carved. Numerous large stained glass windows were installed in pedimented niches within the panelling, illuminated from behind. Like the lounge, the ceilings and windows were raised above the level of the boat deck for increased height and the room was flanked by alcoves with bay windows, also in stained glass. The floor was laid with blue and red linoleum tiles and the plaster ceiling was moulded with plaster medallions. In the centre of the far back wall was a Norman Wilkinson painting, Plymouth Harbour, which hung over a coal burning fireplace in white marble. This was the only real fireplace on board. The others were installed with electric heaters. Square tables with raised edges to prevent drink spillage in rough weather dotted the room, surrounded by round club chairs upholstered in leather of an unknown colour, possibly green or burgundy. To the right of the fireplace was a revolving door which led to the veranda cafe. The room was U-shaped because the ventilation shaft from the turbine engine room occupied the forward end and to vent out smoke from the fireplace and cigars. 
This area also included bathrooms. The smoking room was the preferred spot of gamblers who crossed the Atlantic. Professional card sharks also travelled on board under aliases, and the purser could do nothing but warn passengers about these swindlers, since passengers played at their own risk. At least four professional players travelled on board the Titanic. Cigars and drinks could be made available upon request of the passengers, and were provided by the stewards of the adjacent bar. The bar opened at 8.30am and stopped serving at 11.30pm, and the smoking room itself closed at midnight. It was in this room that William Thomas Stead quietly read a book during the sinking. Also in this room, standing at the fireplace, was the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews, reportedly seen here shortly before the ship founded. This story, which was published in a 1912 book, came from John Stewart, a steward on board the ship who in fact left the ship in lifeboat 15 at approximately 1.45am. However, a contradictory account by Cecil William Fitzpatrick places Andrews on the bridge just before the Titanic sunk. The Titanic's first class lounge was located on A deck. The first class lounge is one of the most ornate public rooms on board the Titanic, modelled in the Louis XIV style. It occupied a large space midship on A deck, offering views onto the promenade deck and the ocean beyond. Intricately carved English oak panelling with intermittent motifs of musical instruments were the dominant feature of the room. Bronze sconces and large rounded mirrors were installed throughout. A 49 light opaque glass and ormolu electrically with crystal embellishment occupied the central recess of the ceiling, which was itself elaborately moulded with instrumental motifs. Adjoining the open seating area were cosy alcoves with inset mirrors and tall bay windows of leaded and stained glass. The lounge had an impressive height of 12 foot 3 inches, enabled by raising the ceiling above the level of the boat deck. Groups of tables and chairs, sofas and armchairs, upholstered in plush velvet with green and gold floral patterns, were scattered throughout. At the centre of the forward wall was a gracefully carved grey marble decorative fireplace. A replica statue of the Diana of Versailles stood on the mantelpiece, with a large mirror above. At the opposite end, the wall curved and contained a wide mahogany bookcase, which functioned as a lending library for first-class passengers. They could choose from a permanent collection of classics and the latest releases, which were freshly stocked on every voyage. Open daily between 8am and 11pm, the room was used primarily for socialising, playing cards, reading books, and the taking of tea, coffee and light refreshments before and after dinner. It was a largely female domain, but available to both sexes. Because of its size, it was also convenient for holding concerts and other first-class events. After the collision with the iceberg, passengers gathered in the lounge to avoid the biting cold while awaiting further instructions from the crew. Witnesses testified the Titanic's orchestra began their performance that night in the lounge at this time, 12.15 a.m. The Titanic had a total of over 371 first-class staterooms, 41 of which could be used as second-class staterooms. The Titanic and her sister Olympic offered the finest and most luxurious first-class accommodations to be found on any contemporary ocean liner. The cheapest first-class fare could be had for £23, equivalent to £2,200 in 2018. A suite could range in price from £400 to £870 for a deluxe parlour suite at the height of the travelling season. The 120 special staterooms on B and C deck were richly appointed in 11 different period styles, including Adam, Louis X, 9th and 14th, French Empire, Georgian, Jacobian and Italian Renaissance. Some styles like Adam or Louis X had different variations used in certain staterooms, which incorporated elements from other periods, bringing the total of different designs to 19 including the 11 base styles. In addition, there were two custom Harlan and Wolf designs known as Bedroom A and Bedroom B, which were used in a total of 43 bedrooms between B and C decks. These were period inspired but modernised and considered equal in quality to the 11 stringent period styles. B 
Bedroom A was the plainer of the two, featuring fielded wood panels painted white, resting on a three foot high carved oak dado and furnished with a brass or wooden bedstead. Bedroom B was known as the French cabin because it was Louis IX inspired, featuring varnished oak panelling and cabriolet furniture. In the special staterooms there was a wide range of finely crafted panelling, veneers and marquetry made from exotic imported woods like mahogany, sycamore, walnut, oak and satinwood. Such was the attention to historic detail that every piece of furniture, light fixture, upholstery and woodwork was recreated with an obsessive care for accuracy by designers and master craftsmen at Harlan and Woof. There are a small number of outside contractors hired to fit out select rooms or provide furnishings. The Dutch firm of HP Mutters and Zoon, for instance, fitted out 12 of the special staterooms, according to the chosen period styles, supplying everything from the panelling and doors down to the sofa pillows, down bed quilts and waste paper baskets. The most splendid first class accommodation on both the Titanic and Olympic were the four parlour suites, two each on B and C deck, just aft of the forward grand staircase landings. The two on B deck were advertised at Dulux parlour suites, or promenade suites, because they each contained a 50 foot private promenade deck. The promenade deck connected to the first class gangway entrances immediately forward, enabling the copious amounts of luggage usually carried by the Titanic's richest passengers to be loaded directly into their suites. The parlour suites each comprised two large bedrooms, two walk-in wardrobes, a private bathroom, lavatory and a spacious sitting room. The sitting rooms were lavish rooms that were allowed for receiving small parties of guests, each featuring a faux fireplace, large card table, plush sofas and chairs, sideboards and writing desks. The gymnasium was just aft of the forward grunt staircase along the starboard side of the boat deck. It was described as a wonderful innovation for an ocean going liner at the time. It was a brightly lit room with white painted oak panelling and tile floors. Along the wall opposite the entrance was a carved oak installation with an illustrated cutaway of an Olympic class ocean liner and a map depicting the travel routes of the white star line throughout the world. The room was equipped with state-of-the-art exercise equipment manufactured in Wiesbaden, including two electric camels, an electric horse, a rowing machine, a punching bag, a weightlifting machine and mechanical bicycles. Tickets, priced at one shilling, were available from the purser and entitled first-class passengers to one session in this facility. There was a permanent physical educator on staff named T.W. McCauley, physical educator for the White Star Line who assisted passengers in using the devices. The gymnasium was open during the following hours and like other recreational facilities aboard the Titanic, segregated by gender and age. 9am to 12pm for ladies only, 1 to 3pm for children only, and 2 to 6pm for gentlemen only. The White Star Line said that passengers could indulge in the action of horse riding, cycling, boat rowing, etc. and obtain both beneficial exercise as well as endless amusement. One of the most popular attractions was the electric camel, an exercise riding machine that mimicked the gait of a camel. When the ship was sinking, the gymnasium was engulfed with first class passengers while they waited for permission to board the lifeboats. John Jacob Astor took a life jacket and cut it open to show his wife it was filled with cork. On the fateful night of 15th of April 1912, Macaulay remained at his post in the gymnasium and went down with the ship. Some of the equipment is still in place on the wreck. The window frames to the boat deck are broken and gone. The walls were bent as the number two funnel fell to starboard over the roof of the gym. In 1986, Robert Ballard and his crew were able to look through the windows of the gymnasium with the Jason Jr. ROV and recognise some of the equipment. The remains of all of this have since sunken into A deck below. The roof of the deck house, which enclosed the gymnasium, has long since collapsed and the room itself is sinking into the deck below. Nonetheless, the wood panelling that lined the walls is recognisable and so are some of the exercise machines.
The Café Parisien was a Parisian-style café and a new feature of the RMS Titanic. It was located on A deck, starboard just off the aft grand staircase. It was promoted as a replica of a Parisian sidewalk café. Painted in white, with live English ivy and a long green carpet that rang the length of the room, it was designed to occupy a part of the space which on the Olympics served as a rarely used B-deck promenade. Located on the starboard side, the cafe was connected to the a la carte restaurant. Like the restaurant, the Café Parisien was open from 8am to 11pm and shared the same menu and servers. The cafe was furnished with wicker tables and chairs, accommodating up to 68 passengers, and was decorated in ivy-covered trellises and other climbing plants. A Dutch firm in rattan furniture from Den Haag delivered the white wicker chairs. There was a tiered buffet stand in the centre of the room and sideboards were sited at each end of the room containing the china service. The Café Parisien was most popular among young adults. The Café Parisien was a place where the friends could meet for conversation with drinks, coffee or a little something stronger and light refreshments. It was the first of its kind on any British passenger liner. On the RMS Titanic, this spot was part of the first class promenade, which ran the full length of both sides of B Deck. It was later installed on the RMS Olympic, and privacy screens were added, and double doors added as well, making it enclosed. On April the 14th, the night Titanic struck the iceberg, the menu included oysters, salmon, roast duckling, sirloin of beef, pate de gras, peaches, in chartreuse jelly, and chocolate and vanilla eclairs. The a la carte restaurant was located on B deck, aft of the aft grand staircase. The restaurant was a luxurious restaurant open exclusively to first class passengers. The Olympic and Titanic were the first British ships to feature restaurants separate from their main dining saloons. This was in imitation of the Ritz restaurant, first featured on board the Hamburg America liner SS America in 1905, which had proven to be enormously popular. The restaurant could accommodate 137 diners at a time. On the Olympic, the room was sandwiched between the second-class promenades on either side, making it smaller than the version on Titanic, whose restaurant extended to the port side of the ship and whose starboard side promenade deck was converted to the Café Parisien. The restaurant was the preferred alternative to the main dining saloon and gave passengers the option of enjoying lavish French haute cuisine at an additional cost. A passenger could choose to eat exclusively in the restaurant for the duration of the voyage and receive a three to five pound rebate on his or her ticket at the time of booking. Unlike the main dining saloon, the restaurant gave passengers the freedom to eat whenever they liked, anywhere between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. The restaurant was not managed by the White Star Line. Luigi Gatti ran it as a concession and his staff were not part of the regular crew. The restaurant was one of the most luxurious rooms on the ship, decorated in Louis XVI style, with exquisitely carved French walnut panelling trimmed in gilt brass accents. Fluted columns interspersed throughout the room were carved with gilded ribbons, and the plaster ceilings were delicately moulded with flower and ribbon motifs. Mirrors were installed with the panelling imitating windows, and the room was divided into bays along either side with oval mirrors inset. Along the forward wall was a large buffet with a peach coloured marble top and along the aft wall was a raised bandstand for the orchestra with buffets on either side containing the silver service and cutlery. The restaurant featured its own custom spode china service in gilt and cobalt blue. Axminster carpeting and rose de barry covered the floors and the plush chairs of French walnut were upholstered in pink rose patterned Orbison tapestry. The a la carte restaurant provided the most intimate atmosphere on board. In fact, half the tables in the restaurant catered for two people, whereas very few of such tables were offered in the main dining saloon. The restaurant had its own reception room, located next to the aft grand staircase on B deck. That room was decorated in the Georgian style, featuring armchairs and settees draped in carmine coloured silk, and a space was reserved for the orchestra. It allowed passengers to gather together before and after their meals. The Boat Deck 
on which the lifeboats were positioned was the topmost of the ten decks on the Titanic. It was from here in the early hours of 15th of April 1912 that Titanic's lifeboats were lowered into the North Atlantic. The bridge was at the forward end in front of the wheelhouse and the captain's and officer's quarters. The bridge stood 8 feet or 2.4 metres above the deck, extending out to either side so that the ship could be controlled while docking. The wheelhouse stood directly behind and above the bridge. The entrance to the first class, grand staircase and gymnasium were located midship along with the raised roof of the first class lounge, while at the rear of the deck were the roof of the first class smoke room and the relatively modest second class staircase entrance. The wood covered deck was divided into four segregated promenades for officers, first class passengers, engineers and second class passengers respectively. Lifeboats lined the side of the deck except in the first class area where there was a gap so that the view would not be spoiled. The boat deck was the last to flood, not flooding until around 2.05am which was the ship's final moments. We would like to thank the team at Vintage Digital Revival for the images shown in this video. We will leave a link in the description for you to download the demo yourself and to donate to the project if you wish. We will now leave you with some footage of the Titanic as she is today at the bottom of the ocean. Thank you for watching.